we're very excited to have um, uh, the next session on Cyber Navigator Program, Successes and Lessons Learned. Um, so today we have with us Bill Eckland, the secu Election Security Cyber Navigator from Minnesota, um, Amy Kelly, the Special Projects Manager in Illinois, and Dave Noonan, the Cybersecurity Manager here in Massachusetts. So we really look forward to hearing about the various programs that are available. And I will turn it over now to Amy, uh, Amy Kelly to go over and start our, us on this program. Actually, other Amy, I will be moderating. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> it's a lot of Amy's we're taking over. Um, so I'm very excited about this session uh, because it came out of a conversation that a few of us were having uh, about uh, where the Cyber Navigator programs are and how we how we understand their effectiveness and, and what kinds of work that they've been doing and how they've been implemented nationwide. Um, so I have a couple of um, questions uh, and then of four or five questions uh, to start the discussion, but uh, my hope is also that our, the NASA members on the call will um, also uh, contribute and ask their questions as well. Um, so first I will um, turn to our three panelists and, and say, all of your states administer elections differently um, and your, your cyber navigator programs are structured a little bit differently as a result. So can you briefly describe how your cyber navigator program is set up? Um, and I'll go to Amy first because uh, they're the Illinois is the OG Cyber Navigator Program. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, Amy. And um, I am honored to be here to talk about uh, the Illinois uh, Cyber Navigator Program. Um, our program is different in that um, we're a bottom up state. So in 2018, when the General Assembly um, passed legislation that specifically tasked our organization, the State Board of Elections, with establishing a cyber navigator program, um, we, did th we did that through administrative rule. Um, and so what we did was having the, um, the bottom-up structure with 108 different jurisdictions, uh, we were tasked with having to provide a program to all 108 election authorities across the state. Um, who all administer their elections at a local level. So we decided through a best practice approach that we would put together a program that would help them better understand um, what to focus on, what to prioritize. Um, as you know, there's an enormous amount of information available to um, state and local election officials. And if you don't have that uh, specialized person in your office to kind of help you parse through that information or talk to you about what's important or um, discuss how you're going to start the improvements in your office, um, really that information isn't useful. Um, so we wanted to provide them with a, a navigator, someone to provide that guidance um, and, and helping them start the process of securing uh, better infrastructure. So I'll just hit on three main component, components um, initially in 2018 uh, that we focused on, and that was one is creating an information sharing uh, program and outreach. By doing that, we partnered with the State Fusion Center to have a centralized point of contact for our election authorities to reach out to report cyber incidents. Um, and then that is how we filter all the information back through um, the state specific information that we share with our vetted partners. Uh, we vet partners in each election office along with their IT and support staff. Um, the second component, of course, is the navigators themselves. We have nine navigators, one that's a lead navigator that works specifically with me um, and in partnership through our state IT department, which is the Department of Innovation and Technology. Those nine navigators um, are contract workers through them. We wanted to set up our program so that there was a little bit of separation of information so that the State Board of Elections wasn't you know, viewed as more sort of a big brother to the jurisdictions that they had an independent agency separate from us that had the technical expertise and security support that we couldn't give them through the State Board of Elections. Um, those navigators, again, are on contract with them. They're sectioned uh, two in each region. Our county, uh, Illinois County Clerks um, and Recorders Association had already designated the maps, you know, sectioned our state into four zones. So we hired and placed two navigators um, per zone to be the support, having them embedded locally in their community um, to get to know the needs specific to each region of our state. Um, and then the final piece 
would be um, the connection to the Illinois Century Network. Since we are decentralized, we use the premise of what law enforcement in our state uses, um, a secure internet connection to connect to the sheriffs um, in the county. So we use that model to create a, a secure elections infrastructure for our local jurisdictions to connect to our statewide voter database. It takes that traffic off the World Wide Web and puts it in a secure um, elections network with the connection directly from us to the local jurisdiction. So, um, of course, there's more uh, components to the program, and as we've grown, we've added things to it. But that, in a nutshell, is generally um, the major components of our program. Great, thank you. And do we say Bill is going next or David? I don't remember. <laughs> I think we settled on me going next. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, and thanks again for the chance to spend a few minutes talking about our Minnesota Cyber Navigator program. So. Um, as I step through some of the things about our program, you'll certainly notice some overlap over some of the things that uh, Illinois is doing as well. But I think the key distinction between our program and the one you just heard about really is a, is a factor of scope and scale. So um, our program came together fairly late in the game, uh, certainly inspired by the cyber activity of 2016 uh, and, and enabled by the HAVA appropriations that came thereafter. Um, but it took us a while to get the funding freed up through our state legislature, which kind of got us out of the gate slowly relative to the 2020 election. So um, in terms of the size of our program, you're looking at it. I'm the guy, uh, an army of one, if you will, uh, Navy of one from my personal background, but uh, it really is a, is, is a different focus because of that. So I came aboard the team in late 2019, right on the heels of, uh, of launching into the, our presidential nominating primary coming in March. Uh, and had to kind of figure out what we could do in very short order to try to make a difference relative to the election events of 2020. So uh, we really tried to focus on awareness in general, awareness of two things, uh, primarily, first and foremost, about cyber threats uh, to election related systems that might impact our county election officials, um, but also awareness of the resources that are already available to all of them to help reduce the risk uh, that may otherwise befall those systems. So uh, that two prong approach of awareness and uh, it is really what I think our focus has been. Uh, we really focused uh, out of the gate on building the network of people uh, that, that do this work for a living. And that has a, also a dual focus, of course, the election officials in each of our 87 counties, um, but also reaching out directly to the IT leadership in each of those counties as well and making sure they were aware of some of the unique aspects of protecting the election related systems within their jurisdictions and making sure that they had a good uh, functional relationship with their uh, the election staff in their county uh, and that they were talking regularly and sharing priorities and concerns and, and building that internal discussion inside. Um, so all of my outreach to Minnesota counties is to both of those individuals. I view them as a team at that local level. And I, I, I work with them both to, to make them aware of the threats and so forth. Um, and then the other aspect of that relationship building is really with our state and the local federal partners here in Minnesota. Uh, again, sort of uh, as Illinois referenced as well and, and building those bridges between uh, some of our uh, agencies, the, our, our IT agency, for example, and our public safety apparatus that also track some of the concerns related to election security. And just making sure that everyone knows who they can ask, where they can go with questions and concerns and also funneling information from those sources to each of those local partners at the county level as well. Uh, so it's all about, um, I like to say about the low hanging fruit, you know, it's about the communication and the relationships and, 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 and leading, navigating, if you will, helping navigate all the resources that are out there. Um, I do a fair bit with mass communications, emails, but I also communicate individually with each of our county partners as well and, and our larger cities uh, so that it does become a personal interaction with each of them uh, it helps get the emails read. It helps get the phone calls answered uh, and really brings the proper attention and focus on issues of cybersecurity as relate to elections in Minnesota. Uh, the bottom line is we want to add value. We don't want to just be another bureaucratic layer for our election and IT officials. Um, and the feedback so far, I think, through 2020 is that we found a way to do that. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll look forward to any questions from the, from the audience. David? Well, thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you, Bill and, and Amy Kelly for uh, uh, starting this off. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce what Massachusetts has done with the Cyber Navigator program. First thing we did was uh, we took as much information from both Bill and what was publicly available from uh, Illinois, uh, 
uh, several conversations. I know Mike St. Marie, who's our team leader, had with Bill over the phone, and he was he was very gracious in providing uh, what's he, what he has learned. Uh, we're in year two of the program net right now, um, and uh, we rebranded it, uh, took the, the name Cyber, Cyber Navigator and actually called it in Massachusetts ESP for Election Security Partnership. Um, and uh, we introduced it as our partnership program with the local cities and towns. In Massachusetts, we have 351 municipalities, cities and towns, um, that uh, administer the elections at the local level. So um, we took the the state of Massachusetts, as you can see behind me, my, my Vanna White here, um, uh, in five regions, and we split them up into uh, groups of 65 to 70. Uh, we put five regional analysts out there um, and one manager, Mike St. Marie, is, is the manager. Um, so he's the team leader. We've, in two years, we've taken this, what is a voluntary program, we did not mandate this, um, a voluntary program, and we've got it up to 80% uh, adoption at this point. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with that. 80% uh, adoption for a voluntary program is, is great. Um, one of the first initiatives that we did was, was ask them to um, sign up for MSISAC, and um, we so that gives us roughly 320 cities and towns right now, members of, um, of MSISAC and EIISAC uh, receiving that, those, those notifications on a regular basis. We have several other initiatives that I'll get into later, but um, one of the things early on we went through with the, each of the cities and towns and created a baseline uh, through several questionnaires of where they are uh, with their cybersecurity hygiene and took that baseline. Uh, so every city and town has a, a, has a separate baseline uh, score, uh, and we don't want to call it a scorecard because it's, it's really not that, but it's, it's just really a baseline of where they are and set a goal for where we want to get them um, in the years to come. So that, that whole initiative, getting the baseline for each of the cities and towns, uh, took, took a better part of the first year, um, and part of that was uh, hindered by COVID. One of the things we learned that we're much more successful in person than we are over Zoom and uh, over the phone. So um, that's where we are. That's some of our differences. And uh, two years into the program, we're, we're very happy with it. We're happy what we've been able to borrow from the other states and look forward to sharing anything that uh, anybody wants from us. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all. Um, so you all hit on some uh, common themes but I'm curious from each of your states, what are things that you think worked extremely well in your state uh, with uh, sort of building the relationships and, and the success of these programs? Take it away, Amy, you're smiling. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. So um, like the other states, we were on a time crunch too to try to get as much accomplished as we could before uh, 2020, and that included hiring our navigators um, and getting uh, them all signed up for the requirements of the program. We did have an EII SEC requirement sign up. We did have, a, uh, before the uh, 2020 election, a goal of getting our baseline risk assessments accomplished. We did do that as well. Um, and then now, you know, getting out, being able to pre um, the pandemic, having those introductions, those, you know, close uh, sit down discussions with not only the election authorities, but also their IT staff and just, can, you know, conducting those initial risk assessments, creating a baseline. We did the same thing as Massachusetts did that said, you know, here are what we feel you should prioritize. We did make available um, HAVA funding through grants to help them um, fund these changes and upgrades to their systems that um, were identified through the risk assessment. So that was a really successful part. We are a volunteer program as well. We are at 100% participation. Um, and of course, having those funds available to help mitigate some of those issues that were identified in our assessments was something that we think, you know, fueled participation and willingness. Um, when you have those conversations with individuals and, you know, you identify things that are are, uh, you know, causing issues or of concern as you enter a presidential election and then giving them funding to help 
um, fix those issues was I think something that was very well received from our locals. We're still able to um, each fiscal year offer a little bit of money to sustain some of those and improve. Um, another thing that we did that was extremely um, successful is uh, we procured at a state level um, endpoint protection that we offered for free to our locals. The navigators helped with the um, setup and initial discussions with those IT individuals at a local level. So if there was a jurisdiction that couldn't afford endpoint, we had that available for them at no charge. Um, it's supported through our stock at the, the Department of Innovation and Technology as well. So that was another thing that was really successful, uh, giving them the option procuring something from a statewide. Um, Partnering with our other uh, state agencies that had services that they could offer for free, we uh, had great success in partnering with uh, emergency management agencies and helping them prov provide um, guidance on writing, um, you know, how are they going to respond in certain, you know, their plans for um, even things as such as weather incidents, you know, having those those plans in place, who to talk to. We provided media templates to all jurisdictions. Not every jurisdiction has um, a public information officer. So providing them templates through, you know, even their local emergency managers to partner with was something else that was a great success. Became in, uh, very handy during COVID because those relationships were already established. We were able to um, help in shipping out hand sanitizer, masks, um, and we coordinated all of that through the Cyber Navigator program because we already had established those relationships. We've worked with our National Guard, another success for them to, to provide support to the state um, on election day, as well as in the event of a statewide event. It's only cyber that they would respond to, but again, a great partnership that wasn't in place before the program um, and working again, specifically with the locals so they understand the information that we're sending out from, from CISA or even Department of Public Health, um, this program was the, the lifeline to getting that information out from a trusted source and then knowing who to contact if they had any questions. So those things worked really well for us. Um, we're looking forward to expanding our program. We did have some legislative uh, changes in the last session there was, I, I can talk about a little bit more, um, it's requiring .gov, so our navigators plan to help with the institution of that. Um, we are going to do annual risk, or biannual risk assessments, um, go back in, vulnerability scanning, and then, um, of course, we already have, as I talked about, the endpoint detection, but all of those things were added in the last legislative round. We want our program to, um, I think as Bill may have mentioned, you know, we want to build a program that's really beneficial. We ask for feedback all the time. If something's not working, uh, we need to know about it because this program is for the locals, right? We were tasked with providing them something that's useful, helpful, and making sure that we're uh, securing our infrastructure. So that's what we do. That's, we're not interested in just checking boxes. We want to make, we want to make uh, decisions and, and, and provide that support to get to where the election authorities need to be, not just check a box. So that's something that we've worked really hard um, with is having that open conversation about what, um, what works, what hasn't worked and creating a community where it's safe to say so. And I'm happy to say that, that we've, I think we've accomplished that because we get lots of positive and we do get, uh, you know, this isn't working, can we try something else? So. Yeah. I'll turn it back over. Uh -huh. um, Bill and David, um, any uh, real successes from, from your side? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to follow suit. So uh, certainly could, could reference some of the same things that Amy mentioned that worked well in Illinois, um, but I'd key in on just a couple of things and, and one I touched on earlier. I think the single most critical thing we did towards any success we had last year was to directly engage the county IT leadership and, and, and get them engaged in, in their role in election security. Uh, I heard countless times that, you know, they always knew they had a role to protect the county's election related systems, um, but they'd never been engaged by the Secretary of State's office directly. So uh, bringing them into the fold, making them an equal partner along with the elections officials for that critical function of cybersecurity, I think has yielded huge benefit towards uh, tightening up our system and, and, and lowering the risk from uh, uh, cyber related threats. Um, the other thing I would say that was extremely valuable to us through last year's election events was our use of uh, a real time collaboration tool during election events. So we used Microsoft Teams meeting chat room 
uh, to bring in all of our county IT and election officials. True story, we didn't get everybody in there, but they were all invited and a large number did attend, particularly around our primary and the general election. Um, so that was uh, envisioned as a means to share cyber related threat activity that we were seeing, you know, in the immediate run up to and on election day. Uh, but we ended up using it for a lot more than that. It was coordinating physical security things, uh, some system related uh, uh, concerns regarding some of our statewide systems. Uh, all kinds of collaboration was taking place there beyond what we even envisioned. So um, we we found that to be a very helpful and successful effort, and we'll certainly continue to improve and build on that in the future. Um, so those are the two that I would key on. Thank you, Bill. I, I'd uh, second the fact that uh, the need to engage IT, right? So that was that was a huge priority for us as well. Um, and in, oftentimes the clerks are thought of in the city and town almost as, as stepchildren to the rest of the city and town when they're, they're not that um, engaged with their own IT department. And, and when we brought the IT department in to, um, to engage them and, and have them understand that the elections infrastructure, um, they were uh, enlightened to how much um, election stuff goes on on their systems as well. So um, that was an important part. Uh, second point I'd, I'd like to make is we, we hide, so our analysts are not election people by, by trade, they're, they're cyber security people by trade. And, um, and that was important to us because the clerks are, are truly the election professionals, right? So, um, and, and we constantly remind the, the analysts or our navigators that you have the cyber security professional to help the election professional in their job uh, do cyber security, right? And, and so what that has done for us is uh, rather than going in and telling them how to do their job, we tell them that you're the, you're the professional for, for elections. We're just here to help you do it in a, in a better cyber hygiene fashion. Um, and, and that's proven well as for us to acknowledge that to them up front. Um, and secondly, we've been able to leverage that technical expertise of the, uh, of the navigators uh, most recently in rolling out uh, several occasions, but most recently rolling out uh, two-factor authentication to all of our 351 cities and towns with only five uh, municipalities left. So we've done that in the past just eight weeks. We rolled out um, two-factor authentication statewide to everyone. So um, having IT uh, savvy navigators and cybersecurity trained uh, to go in and learn uh, elections um, was a prerequisite and, and worked out very well for us. Something David said actually made me uh, want to ask Bill and Amy. Um, are your, I mean, Bill, I know you are the cyber navigator <laughs> for Minnesota, um, but was the priority in Minnesota and in Illinois to hire cyber people or relationship sort of, you know, good relationship builders or both, um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'll turn, I know Bill, you didn't hire yourself, but. <laughs> uh, you're right, I didn't hire myself and I can speak my background a little bit that may, may explain part of why they picked me. And that was, you know, I, I was not a nuts and bolts keyboard cyber guy. I was, uh, come from a military cyber background uh, and did a lot of uh, sort of higher level liaison type work on that function. So for us, that was the right fit. Um, I think we envision growing our program to where we have some more technical people that can do some of the types of functions um, that the other states are doing as well. But for us to launch and get the program rolling, I think was more about being able to communicate about the importance of it than to actually you know, sit down and configure a firewall or any of the other functions that, that more technically savvy people could do. And for us, um, of course, we wanted a little bit of everything. Our key focus when we picked our navigators, though, were um, good communication skills to have a little bit of background, a, a little bit of a technical background. Again, um, there was no there was no elections expert in this space. So we really focused when we uh, right after we hired our navigators, um, they came into the state board of elections offices and spent several days with us. And, you know, we kind of went over how the structure of, of elections work, but 
you know, like Bill said, or, um, or David, I think, said maybe um, we, our election officials are the experts in the authority, and we wanted someone that could communicate with them at that local level, listen to them, listen to their concerns, and then provide that technical, um, you know, you, extra earpiece to say this is what we think because our navigators don't touch the systems um, the systems are owned and you know the responsibility of our locals we wanted somebody that would be that extra voice in the room that would say maybe you know hey try this or we recommend that because our our program is based on best practices i think a big part of it was communication um, skills and making sure the, that our navigators have the ability to say you know if we don't know the answer we have all these resources at the state level through our statewide IT department will go back to them and say, can you help us? And then if the Department of Innovation and Technology, you know, they leaned heavily on us for the election side. And I would say, you know, that's not gonna work. That's not how elections work. And I think that's where our tabletops came in really, um, really, you know, helpful and successful in the beginning of our program. Um, we invited those individuals in and we sat down and sitting at tables with our election officials as we did some of these exercises, um, they were, their minds were blown of how they had, you know, I remember our statewide CISO saying, like, I had no idea that there was all these, you know, procedures in place for if someone forgets to bring their chili crock pot on election day, like there was already a backup plan for those things. So that, I think that's important too, if you're thinking about starting a program, have a tabletop, get your people all together. Um, you, they'll learn a lot from each other and it's a great introduction into how you want to communicate uh, across the state. Um, so all three of you have talked about things that have worked really well, um, but you've also alluded to the fact that you've made changes as you've gone along based on feedback from your local election officials. Um, can you talk at least at a high level about um, some of the things that you've had to change as you've gone along? Um, and we'll start with David and we'll go backwards. So one of the lessons learned that we've had is, is that our analysts have to be thick skinned, right? So they can, um, they can get the Heisman or get the pushback um, so often and they can't really take it personally. Um, and, and that's something that uh, not everybody can do. Some people just can't take rejection, but you, you need to be a salesperson. You need to be salesy and you have to uh, continuously um, without being a nuisance, but uh, continuously remind those uh, clerks what the benefit that you're bringing to them. Because what are we fighting? We're fighting the, the thought that it's Big Brother coming in or you're coming in to audit, and that's really not the case. You know, some, one of our, uh, actually one of our most successful analysts came from an audit background. So there was, during his um, indoctrination or introduction to, um, to uh, elections, we had to take that audit mindset away from him and, and tell him, you're not here to, to be an auditor, you're here to put your arm around the clerk and, and assist them in something that may or may not be familiar to them, but you're here to help them with the process, do it together. Uh, ultimately, each of these analysts will be uh, measured by how their 65 to 70 customers uh, do in in progressing their um, their cybersecurity maturity, right? So uh, that baseline will be measured across each region, and every analyst will be um, graded basically on how how they were able to uh, increase the maturity of their region as a whole. Thanks, Bill. I would say two things come to mind. I think uh, one of the key lessons I learned early on was it, it is possible to over communicate. And uh, as soon as I was able to build a, a list of mass, you know, a mass list of email addresses, 300 some, you know, election and IT officials, um, it was easy to forward a whole lot of stuff that most of them didn't want, need, or care about. So um, I had to learn to be selective and find that sweet spot about what's the stuff that I hope that they will pay attention to. Uh, without overburdening them with stuff that is is down in the weeds. And I'll just say one of the things that's helped about this is that uh, I was trying to cover sort of a broad cybersecurity function beyond just elections because there was a gap there between what our state IT agency was doing and, 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 and kind of nothing. Uh, and so since we've got our program up and running, our state IT agency has sort of copied the function and has hired a 
cyber uh, security operations center cyber navigator who will sort of mirror my function, but more generically for cyber related threats to uh, uniquely to IT personnel across the, the state. So that I think will kind of fix that problem. Um, the other one I think uh, that, I, that, that was a key lesson was that um, each relationship is unique. Uh, I think David mentioned big brother, and I think there are certainly parts of, of our state where we are viewed sort of in that fashion. Uh, and it's important to sort of recognize that the, the right engagement uh, is different for each county. And so some like a lot of uh, uh, direct contact, some kind of want minimal and kind of feeling that out for each one so that you can continue to have a productive relationship with each has been another sort of process of uh, feeling our way along. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Amy? Yeah, so early on, uh, again, we learned that um, the, the math email is your friend and it can also be your enemy. So through our information sharing program, we received feedback that, you know, it was just too much. It was too technical for the election authorities themselves. So we went in and created two distribution lists and we really targeted the information that we sent. The more technical information went straight to IT individuals, um, security staff, support staff, and if the clerk did or uh, election official did request to be on that more technical list, we put them as well. Uh, the second distribution list for information was just election official with the more open source information. Um, we send out weekly election briefings that does, you know, link to articles that are relevant to the time shares information from other states that we did through an open source search um, that kind of just highlights and, you know, draws attention to the things that we wanted our election officials to really focus in on. Um, because we were fighting that fatigue, you know, we really hit it hard. We had these things that we wanted to accomplish before 2020. Some of the feedback we got was, you know, every every conference we went to, it was like, oh no, not you again. Um, so we really had to look at an election calendar. We looked at our cycle. We looked at when we knew, you know, because not only do they do elections, they do other things like back taxes. Um, and so what their cycles were when we would schedule our trainings, we didn't want them to view this as something that was so cumbersome to them at busy times that they didn't participate. Um, so we, we changed our focus in on that. We pilot anything um, through, we have an advisory committee um, before we went out and did our first initial uh, round of risk assessments, we reached out to our advisory committee members and we said, hey, will you volunteer to be kind of the first um, individuals that we give the first initial risk assessment to? Uh, myself, the, the CISO for the statewide agency, the navigators, we all went and sat down and had, you know, the first initial sat through the, the questions and we determined then it was just far too technical what we had originally come up with to start that conversation about an over, you know, an organizational uh, discussion about their risks. So we went back to the drawing board. We created more of a survey that's questionnaire based. Um, we created kind of a small PowerPoint that um, compared their infrastructure to uh, home security in their own homes. That was really successful. So, um, and then our annual trainings that, that are required a lot of times, you know, through our, even through our state department, we have to, or our state IT department, we have to take a, a required annual training. Clicking through a PowerPoint and signing off wasn't really something that um, anybody was getting any benefit from. So we decided that our annual trainings would be done in person. Um, through, through the pandemic, we did them over WebEx where we sat with the election official, one person from the office was designated. They could ask specific questions about the training. Then we shared that training um, in if it one if if the uh, you know county IT or security professional wanted to send it to other offices we were fine with that um, just to create more of a conversation outside the election office um, so that we could get other municipal offices on board with supporting the infrastructure because as we all know those those offices touch each other um, in multiple ways so those were some of the things that we you know learned right from the gate that we had to make some changes on and um, and and we also created a newsletter um, that was more fun sometimes we you know put silly puzzles in or games uh, we highlight a navigator so that they can get to know them a little bit more or a navigator from outside of their region in case someone has to fill in. Um, we've had a little turnover in our navigators. We've lost two uh, since the creation of the program. So it's just a way for us to have a little bit more casual conversations and highlight things that are important um, as we reach, you know, critical election cycles. 
Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I know there are some questions uh, from Scott. So we'll open it up now uh, to uh, questions. I know Lori from Washington has one. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, sharing your stories today. Um, we stood up a very similar program here in Washington, utilizing our HAVA security funding. Um, and we're now working to navigate the program to state general fund. Um, so I'm curious, how did you fund your programs? I think you touched on that, but if you did use grant funding, are you also um, working to navigate to a, to a different funding source? Um, and, and I think really where I'm going is, uh, do you have concerns about um, your ability to continue funding these vital programs uh, because the midterms and the next presidential are right around the corner? So I'll start, Amy, I guess. So we, we're only in year two and we are funding with Harvard funds as well. Um, we don't have a plan. Uh, to move forward with uh, funding it statewide or through the regular budget, but um, if I think we've proven value enough to to both Michelle Tassinari and the secretary, as well as the clerks themselves, that uh, this certainly could be uh, some, a program that that uh, has merit to move forward. And uh, this is Bill. I'll go next. So our program is also fully funded out of HAVA. Again, with just one person, it's relatively low cost. Uh, and with some of the uh, modification of, of, of HAVA requirements, as we understand it, to allow us to extend that out over a further timeline, um, we think we have a reasonable expectation to continue to fund out of HAVA uh, at, at a slightly expanded scope um, over the next couple, few, several years. And for Illinois, um, it's a mix. We are largely funded by uh, HAVA funding, but we also um, have started to incorporate because we are planning for long-term sustainability of the program and the proven success of it across sectors. And when you partner with other agencies like we did, um, and they see the value in it too, when you know we start advocating to kind of build this into our general revenue budget for each agency and we're, you know, our agency is going and asking for X amount of dollars and then the Department of Innovation and Technology is doing the same thing because we've proven that this model works. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback in our requests to kind of move what the important parts um, of the program are that we think we can sustain long-term uh, through our through our general revenue fund, but we did start largely with HAVA funding, and are working now on our plan to move as we uh, you know run out of the federal money, and hopefully uh, we get some extra. But until then, we do have a plan working with other agencies to move the critical portions of it to be state funded. Thank you. Um, do we have other questions? Um, you can either just unmute and ask or put it in the chat. Amy, is that all right if I ask a question? Yeah, go right ahead. Hi, Dylan Lynch from the Iowa Secretary of State's office, um, essentially the cyber navigator for the state. I had a question regarding the establishment of the programs you all have and the priorities and that were they established legislatively uh, through administrative rules, a combination, or if you all are just kind of going off of best practices? I can start. Ours was created um, legislatively, and then, you know, we created the uh, rules to go with the, the legislation that was passed. But we do have the flexibility to create a program that works for all 108 election officials. Um, we use our rules and any legislation, subsequent legislation that has been passed to meet the, the requirements, of course, you know, um, but that doesn't keep us in just those tight confines of what the law does. We are expanding our program. Um, we work with multiple state agencies to, to get their feedback as well, but ours is based on uh, legislation created and administrative rules. So here in Massachusetts, we're not uh, legislated uh, for this program, but uh, we learned of this program uh, that, that, that Illinois put forth uh, uh, 
uh, at a, at a NASAD um, conference and thought it was a good idea. Brought it back, um, uh, wrote copious notes uh, from a, a presentation, uh, some discussion around the program, and took it from there to uh, implement here. Um, and uh, learned as much as we could, gleaned as much as we could from the other partners across the country that were uh, putting this forth, and and learned and, and uh, adapted the program as we uh, understood some some best practices and some lessons learned. And in, in Minnesota, I would say most of those determinations happened before I came on board. But my understanding is our uh, inception was similar to David's in Massachusetts. Uh, in that it was sort of uh, acknowledging this as a, a great idea way forward. Uh, and I would say though that we did sort of, um, although there's no legislation that dictates what we must do, we did use uh, proposed functions for the, the position and the program as part of the argument for approval of the HAVA funding to be released to the Secretary of State's office from the legislature uh, to allow us to go forth. So we do try to uh, make sure we're meeting those uh, promises and requirements we made for the program. I have a question in the chat about um, what controls you're using. If you're using like the the NCSR or the CIS controls or the NIST, you know, cybersecurity uh, controls. Um, all of you sort of mentioned doing risk assessments, so uh, people are curious sort of what benchmarks you're using. So uh, I'll start again. Uh, all, all of our con all of our actions. Uh, can be mapped back to CIS controls, and we we chose the CIS controls because I think they're they use the most plain English and they're the most easiest to communicate. So if we can map them back to a CIS control, ultimately that can be mapped. Somebody else did the work mapping that back to the NIST controls or the NIST recommendations. So um, if we can bring them to uh, to the CIS controls and and that helps us communicate them, you can map it back to any framework you wanted to. Is what Illinois did as well. We we preferred the CIS approach. It was, as David said, more uh, easily consumable at the local level. And then it, the navigators are tasked with mapping that back and providing those. We don't like to call them scores either, but we do give you know an overall assessment result and then tie them back to to those uh, those benchmarks. So I guess we're sort of the lone outlier and having gone a little bit of a different direction. The assessment that we made available to our counties last year was a commercial capability that we procured through a vendor. Uh, it's based in the NIST standards, uh, but we did sort of layer a um, election specific aspect on top of that, that uh, that is more in line with some of the CIS election related stuff. But it, but it really was also more about a survey of us to better understand some of the systems present across the elections landscape in Minnesota. So kind of a hybrid of all of the above, I would say. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have more, but <laughs> I wanna make sure we get to uh, everybody here. So all of you mentioned um, needing to engage with um, county or, or city town IT in addition to um, your local election officials. Was there resistance from, or, or I mean, I, I think a couple of you mentioned that they were surprised uh, how much of the local infrastructure was being used, but were they resistant at all to having you guys be part of the process or to more actively engaging with election officials? I'll take that one. If, David, if you're unmuted. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, David, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say quickly, um, for the most part, the, the ones uh, in our 87 counties were receptive to being engaged. And I think part of that was, uh, you know, we stole the bully pulpit of the 2020 election early last year. They all knew it was a big deal. They all wanted to be a part of it. And I think we were able to co-op that momentum and that energy to get their participation uh, in, in securing election related systems. So, 
So in Massachusetts, I think uh, we're we're a little bit unique in that the the, the infrastructure that that houses our our election information is is owned by the Secretary of State and, and funded by the Secretary of State. So we we control that, but there's other functions that that happen, and you know um, we often say that uh, you know. The, Every boat rises as the tide comes up, right? So the, if, if the town's municipal infrastructure from what the clerk uses, if, if their cybersecurity hygiene gets better, so does the way that they use our equipment. Um, so, um, and, and plus, you know, there's other functions, there's emails, there's extracts, there's other things that make their way to um, the, the municipal uh, city and town system. So. In, in Massachusetts, we've found that some cities and towns have a very well-funded IT department that uh, do a great job with, um, with IT and IT security, and then there's other cities and towns that, uh, you know, the IT person happens to be the person that could spell IT, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, that person is, is the one that's tasked with the security and the one that we engage with um, to try to try to uh, improve the cyber hygiene in, the, in that city and town. So um, uh, certainly a myriad of um, uh, one end to the other uh, with regards to uh, IT expertise and cyber hygiene. So we've had to adopt uh, different aspects of, of how to deal with both ends of the spectrum. I can kind of piggyback on what David just said. That's our experience, um, you know, the more the larger jurisdictions that have funding available to them and we're already kind of working in this space since 2016 and what happened to Illinois, we kind of had to bear our soul to our jurisdictions and say, you know, we, we've been there, we understand, we're just trying to help you get to a place where, uh, you know, when, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when something happens to you, you're in a space where you're more prepared, you can, as the elected official, stand up in front of your constituents and say that you did everything that you could possibly do. Um, to secure your networks, to provide, um, you know, to have that conversation with them, um, I think was beneficial. We did, I, I'm not going to say that, you know, everyone welcomed us with open arms. There were some jurisdictions, of course, that did, and others we did have to spend a little bit more time with. Um, and I think that's where our navigators were really helpful, having that kind of separation from the State Board of Elections through the statewide um, IT department help them quickly realize that, you know, we as the, at the state board said, we're not experts in this area. We have improvements that we need to do as well. So we're gonna partner with an agency that can provide those um, resources to you, help. And uh, to be quite honest, um, not that I wanted it to happen, but shortly after we started to roll out this program, we had a, a mid-sized jurisdiction that had an incident. And once you start having um, those locals go to your local, you know, regional meetings or at a statewide meeting that's hosted for election officials and start talking about what we did to help them get their system stood back up. That was something that was really helpful to us. So, you know, once we were able to prove that we were there simply to help, simply to provide guidance, simply to work with their IT specialists to get them the resources they needed to get back up, um, I think that those kind of as those incidents rolled out, we were able to prove to the people who, who maybe weren't as um, open-minded to our assistance to kind of convince them that this was a good program and that it was a program that was there to help them not to take over their, you know, their systems or, or act in, in their, um, in, in any capacity where we touch their systems. Amy, if I could yeah. add one, one other point. Oh, yep, go ahead. The, the a place where we've had some uh, some struggle is uh, when when IT is outsourced, um, and that's uh, that's problematic for us because the city and town expresses to us it costs me money every time I have to call my IT department, my outsourced IT department, um, to come to a meeting or to to talk to anybody, and and they're not uh, very interested in spending money to have them talk to us and us teach them about IT security. So um, th that, that's a problem and we haven't yet been able to solve it, um, but maybe maybe it's us calling them to the table or, 
are convening them on a statewide basis, but so far all we've been able to do is, is compile a list of those uh, small organizations that provide IT, IT uh, support to the local cities and towns. So anybody else has that idea? I wanted to get that out there so that anybody else that's uh, interested in putting together a problem thinks about that ahead of time. But if somebody's already solved that problem, feel free to send it, uh, send me the solution because I'd love to have it. Um, and thank if you. I, um, and if I could just piggyback quickly, David. Um, yep. We do engage directly with some outsourced providers in our state and have, have had pretty good luck. I don't know if they are billing back that engagement to the to the uh, you know the jurisdictions that are are, are, are tender you know holding them on on tender, um, but but they've been happy to again be included in the discussion on behalf of securing the counties that they support. So we've had uh, a fair bit of success working directly with uh, a handful of providers that serve several Minnesota counties. And we're seeing some suggestions in the chat too. Um, one state uh, sent a security posture survey directly to the IT. Uh, contractors. Um, another suggested offering the local uh, offering to include the third parties, the, the vendors in the free cyber training that that gets put on, um, and would help encourage them to participate for free and uh, to Bill's point, not build that time back. Um, we do have a question in the chat um, that I will I will ask, um, and if the from Michigan, from Carol in Michigan, um, please feel free to unmute if I am misunderstanding you here. But um, she said, could you ask how they determine the distribution of funding across the very levels of resources available, the catalog of services um, population, basically how you stop one jurisdiction from taking the whole pot? Their concern was that one jurisdiction would need so much that it would drain all of the money, basically. So in Illinois, we did a, a, a slightly different approach when we started to think about how are we going to keep our larger jurisdictions, of course, from taking the majority of what funding we had available to offer in sub grants. So we did a minimum. We said, you know, at a minimum, everybody's getting this floor of $10,000. And then each, any additional from the, you know, the first round of grants, I think was a $2.9 million grant statewide, everybody got a 10,000 um, threshold. The rest of the award was based on voting age population. Um, but then we did put a caveat in where if we did get into a situation um, through our board approval, if we found a jurisdiction that was in just dire, um, you know, need of more funding because we had some really critical vulnerabilities that were for in need of additional funding, the jurisdiction could write a request to us, we present that to our board for approval to get them additional funds based on need. And that was outlined in the legislation that was passed for our program. Easy answer for Massachusetts. We haven't waded into that water of, of providing uh, grant funding yet. Uh, and that's uh, I, uh, something that we, we really haven't, there's, there's so many opportunities in Massachusetts for the Municipal cities and towns to to uh, to get grants that it's been a value for us to provide uh, the assistance to those cities and towns to be able to apply for those for that grant funding. We haven't uh, um, we haven't had to provide the funding directly from this office. So that's well, fortunate. For just, I'm sorry to cut you off. If I could extend David's metaphor a little further, we've barely dipped our toe into this one ourselves. Uh, we are moving forward on planning for a HAVA grant program through our local jurisdictions and our going in thinking is is sort of in line with what Illinois did that we would have a minimum and then uh, an additional kind of per per voter type structure, um, but it's still very much in the concept development phase. We have another question in the chat from uh, Mike Summers in California. Do your cyber navigators have additional duties besides liaison and risk assessment activities? So in, in Massachusetts, um, they're they're assisting the municipalities with um, disaster recovery plans, uh, incident response plans, um, providing templates for business continuity, 
Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, they were helping to roll out multi-factor authentication. Uh, through each one gets about 65 to 70 customers or contacts that, uh, that they engage with at least once every three months. Um, and um, they also are the resounding gong to make sure that the cities and towns complete their cybersecurity training, they're up to date on their phishing assessments and, and other things. So there's, there's a lot that we've thrown at them, uh, and uh, a little more than just creating that baseline and then measuring uh, year to year. I think uh, the goal is to assist in, in uh, increasing that maturity through some of these other functions. And um, as David said, in Illinois, our navigators do a lot of the same things. They're working with uh, disaster recovery plans. Right now, we're actually going through a second round um, of risk assessments and, you know, circling back to the initial results and then checking off the things that they did. We're able through the funding to, um, you know, secure, mitigate, and then giving them, providing them now with an additional list. We do this in the uh, odd numbered years so that as we move into uh, an even numbered year election cycle, um, they're prepared. You know, we want to, we again, want to focus in on when things need to be done so that we can get them accomplished. We don't want to rush in right before a primary. Our primary was moved, so that gives us a few more months to work with them. Um, it's, it's kind of now going in and talking about what worked in 2020, what they were able to accomplish, and then what we want them to accomplish for 2022. Um, earlier, as things like the physical um, assessment, you know, guidance that CISA issued, we sent that directly to our navigators. We said, make an appointment with each jurisdiction, go out, talk about physical security, come back with recommendations. Um, we instituted drop boxes. Um, officially in Illinois, so we're doing a, uh, having them go out, talk about Dropbox security. So there's always something. Um, and then if an incident does happen, uh, they are kind of the liaison between us and the jurisdiction for if a, a jurisdiction decides they want state assistance, um, we kind of facilitate that through the navigator. They're the person that's actually in the office with, you know, the IT support, the election official, and uh, coordinating any any resources from a statewide level that we can give them to help in, in any incidents. So that's kind of what ours are doing now. Um, we do also have the ability to do the phishing assessments with them. Um, and annual trainings is another thing that we're working on as well. We, we try to do those in person, again, with COVID. If not, we're setting up a lot. There's a lot of virtual trainings going on as well. But we try to do those individualized and one-on-one -on -one as opposed to in a group setting. And really quick, again, as the Cyber Navigator Minnesota, uh, the other things that I do beyond just election cybersecurity would be to expand that liaison function using the contact list I've built uh, to help our state IT agency for more general cybersecurity concerns beyond just elections. Uh, and also uh, our CISA physical security liaison officer in Minnesota has, has, has asked for my help to get his uh, services available. Uh, in support to our office, um, I've been involved in some of the uh, Defending digital democracy, operationalization of election events initiatives we've undertaken. Uh, again, just more a product of my military background than any cyber expertise, but that's it for me. Well, we've come up on time. Um, I want to thank you all. Um, this was exactly what I was hoping for, uh, real nuts and bolts uh, conversations. Um, so I will turn it back to Michelle to close us out for, for this session. Thank you, and thank you to our panelists. I think it's really important for everybody to hear kind of the different types of programs that are available, uh, as well as the different functions. And these are, as David had mentioned, this is the NASA forum is where we had learned about the original um, cyber, cyber navigator programs. And so, you know, we're happy that everyone gets to share information. Um, so we're going to, uh, Amy has sent out the email to, with the invitations for the next session that will start at 3. Um, we look forward to continuing our kind of security, um, our security feature day of uh, elections because we're going to address physical threats to elections um, and election officials uh, at our 3 o'clock session. So we look forward to seeing everyone back here at 3 o'clock or in a new room at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.